All right. Um, yeah, long story short, the company would not survive this. Year. All right. So we were supposed to uh, make something that goes through over and over and over again. So we looked at this compare thing, right? Um, until they finally enter in a carriage return. Okay. So if I hit emulate just to remind myself what the carriage return is, I'll go ahead and hit run. Enter. Okay. So it's 0D. Is our carriage return. All right, so we're looking for a value that's equal to 0D. All right, so we know that moved in every single time we read in a, a value, moved into AL is 0D. We want to compare that with, um, uh, we want to compare that guy with uh, some fixed value 0D. We can either put it in a variable or you can put it in a, another register. Um, so what we can do here is we can come up into our data segment. Um, that's in preparation for something else here in a few minutes. So we're going to say um, um, CR is a data byte, and this guy is 0D, um, 0X, 0D. That'll do it, right? Mm -hmm. or you could have done the 0DH. Yep. Okay. Do we have a preference? Or we like this? That looks cooler, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's then it's just like you're showing off. <laughs> All right, so uh, hopefully I don't think there's anything called CR. So we'll create a variable named CR. This guy's equal to a data byte, which is eight bits, and it's going to be hard coded to our value of a carriage return. All right, so we'll go ahead and read something in. So I guess we can uh, modify this. So we'll start it at a five, um, but, huh? Uh, we tacked it, well, you can just jump back up. Um, but I'll let's just hijack the loop real quick. So let's assume I want to use a loop, but I want this loop to be an infinite loop. What would I what would I have to do to make this loop an infinite loop right now? Just continue yeah, increment cx each time, right? Or just make it basically like one forever. You can just move. Well, what, what point is it? Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you could literally just overwrite it with the two every well, time. What point does it decrement the cx on this when you call the loop command? It decrements and loop decrements it, and then only returns back here if it's cx is zero. Okay. Yep. So it's minus minus cx. It's true. It is true. All right. So we'll go ahead and we'll just uh, uh, ink cx. That's the increment command. So we'll just introduce that real quick. So every single time through cx just stays. <laughs> we increment and decrement so it doesn't actually go down. So our way of escaping from this is to jump to a label, right? So we'll throw a label in here. We'll call this guy done string. Um, indented funny. All right. And then, um, well, done string, you just want to do a return in there. That's when the thing will end for right now, because we're going to end up doing something else with it, but we'll just have it return. Okay. So right now, this is just going to be an infinite loop. So let's just run that real quick and see that that's the case. So there's a run. All right, so infinite loop. Load. Kill this. All right, so now... After we read our character in, we know that the character is currently in AL. We want to compare AL So we're going to compare AL to CR. So AL to our carriage return, this guy here. What do you want to check before you write it in? Um, oh, yeah, we can. I mean, if we if we read it, I mean, it's going to echo it out. So it did, I don't know if that matters, but that, that's fine. Um, so if that makes you that makes you happy. We'll do that. We're not going to see a carriage return, anyways.
So we'll compare AL and CR, and we want to, if those guys are equal to each other, so we want to jump if equals, right? Jump if equals to done string. Will that do it? Infinite loop, keep reading crap in each time through, compare uh, what, what you read in to our carriage return that we stored in a variable. If those guys were equal to each other, jump to done string. Go ahead. Could you also in done string move zero into CR? Because that theoretically would be the same. Well, like it would be. You mean force it to end naturally instead of yeah. jump? Yeah. Yeah, you could. Um, you could actually, if you want to make it supernatural, <laughs> uh, you would uh, move one into CX and then let it decrement to zero. And, uh, we're actually, no. We're uh, increasing it, so it would have to be zero. Well, I mean, we would stop increasing it in that case, but yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, we'd have to make it, we'd have to, we'd have to make it zero, which would then go to one, then go back to zero. Yeah, you could. So rather than jump past it, um, otherwise, what you can do, so I'm guessing you guys did it without the loop, but just use jumps. So you probably uh, created a read-write label here, and then you got rid of the CX crap. So you didn't have to increment CX. And then here, you just have a, is it what, JMP or is it JUMP? It's just JMP, yeah. So basically, if we get to this line, we just jump back to read-write. This is effectively an infinite loop, right? You can do it with one jump. You can do it with one jump. Yeah. By do a jump not equals back up to here, and then let it spill through otherwise? Yep. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. All right. So is this going to work? Run, A, B, C, enter. Seems to work perfectly. Did it kill us? Or yeah. Is it it's done. Oh, I see it. <laughs> I always write perfect assembly code. <laughs> just like uh, just like my C and C++ I haven't written in 20 years. <laughs> it's, it's, it's longer for assembly. They're better than they used to be. Uh, at, least it's, at least you can keep coffee in the cup. Yeah. Well, I just saw I got my second opinion from my neurologist the other day. He says it's not Parkinson's. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So I just said, yeah. As I get older, I'll start flopping around more. And I just... Is what it is. <laughs> then it's after you die and realize, oh, you had something new. Well, I mean, we all know something's wrong with me. The good news is we're going to name the disease after you. Yeah. Awesome fact. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. We're all going to die from something. As long as I feel all right and I'm happy, I'm cool with that. I eat a lot of bacon. So <laughs> that eventually catches up to you. I mean, I literally have four pounds of bacon in my fridge right now. <laughs> I've been buying it in bulk at Meyer. Meyer bacon's legit. They have the, the really thick cut bacon at the meat counter. It's actually good. I've been buying that instead of the packaged stuff. Plus, it's, they just put it, they'll just give it to you in this giant Ziploc bag, so it's really easy to like a dispenser. <laughs> and I cook it on my, uh, I have a grill, kind of like a, it's like a George Foreman, but it's uh, made by somebody else. But uh, I can cook four strips at once. So I cook those on the grill. And then while I'm eating those, I'm cooking my next four. <laughs> huh? It's you just eat, a, you, eat bacon, you eat bacon so quick it bursts. I know, it's so good. but you have you to keep up. you have to let it uh, cool off a little bit so it crisps. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like it really crispy. So I cook it a little extra. So like when you put it in your mouth, it just kind of melts. No, like, you, you want to give it a little. Yeah, I want a crunch. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes I do eat it too quick. You're right. <laughs> you just you, you do it, you guys. It's like me and Dad. It's like, cut him open and it's just going to walk to the man. This guy knew how to live. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the conversations I've had with my cardiologist. <laughs> I go in every single time because I've been on Lipitor for like 20 years. It's like, you know, you know, I, I got to do this. It's my job. <laughs> it's like, we really need you to lose some weight, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, I'm willing to listen, but I'm not giving up bacon. Okay, that's our starting point. <laughs> so, 
I'm not, do find it's like, the no carb. I converted from Judaism. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Except it's hard to stick to no carb because eventually you go off the bandwagon once and you just downward spiral. Yeah, so so low carb diet. Carbs are delicious. I know, but bake, not as good as bacon. It's all a trade off. If only I could have bread and chocolate and pie, <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much anything. <laughs> were you putting ice cream in your coffee for the longest time? I remember that. Remember your oh, mother's yeah. soft serving coffee. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> then they changed the soft serve here and it went downhill. It's awful now. It's bad. I haven't tried it this year. I've been low carb this year. So that should last for. I lost like almost 30 pounds in three weeks. Which is it's equivalent like, to like Kersey Olu's in like two and a half pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, 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 lost, I've lost almost 10 pounds in the last three weeks. Yeah, that's a lot of weight. Wait, yeah, you what? also like. Wrestle with dudes with them. It's no, actually, it's just my diet. You just, you you're you're low calorie now, right? Yeah. Oh, see, I, I, I well, that wouldn't work for me. I know. See, it, it it's tough on me. It's really tough on me. I mean, like I, I, I used to eat over a thousand calories a meal. Oh, I could accidentally eat a thousand calories. <laughs> You'll eat well, a thousand that's, calories that's my, that's as a snack. I, I just, I just, I could eat and eat and eat and have no problem. It sucks. Yeah, that, yeah. I go, I go, I go to the cap and only get like a what, half a plate now, and it's like I'm still hungry. <laughs> Seriously, it's like the dude who's allergic to gluten. I don't know what gluten is, but it's delicious. It's delicious. It's delicious. They need to invent a gluten substitute. I can't believe it's not gluten. <laughs> can't believe it's not gluten. <laughs> All right, so. Um, so we have our thing killing off here. So now we want to go ahead and we want to look at um, the DOS uh, API command for writing a string out to the screen. So we're about to connect the dots here. Okay, so we're going to give ourselves a procedure for writing a string. So I'm going to start off. Uh, let's see, i got to kill this. And I already put uh, this guy in here for right now. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and we're going to say... Uh, Hello world, and then I'm gonna throw a dollar sign at the end of that guy. Uh, you actually don't need the space. All right, so strings in 8086 assembly are terminated by a dollar sign. That tells us end of string. Okay, I'm 99.15 percent this positive that it's not a. What's the rest? It's well, no, it's definitely a dollar yeah. sign, but it, it's that it's not a space dollar sign. I think it's just dollar sign. That it might be a space dollar sign, um, but I think that will work. So we'll see here pretty quick. All right. So now we want to look at the DOS API, and here's writing a string to standard output. So it's ah is nine, and then we put our entry. Notice the the syntax here. It's ds. That's our pointer to our data segment, and then this is an offset. So we're loading into dx an offset from the base of ds where our a uh, dollar sign terminated string lives. All right. So what we're going to do here? Uh, let's see where I want to put this. Here we'll just do it up. We'll do it up top here. So I'm going to move into ah a nine. So that's right string. Okay. Then I'll move into dx the offset of message. Okay. What that will boil down to, down to is the offset from the base pointer of the segment in which message was defined, which is the data segment. This will be the offset off of that where message starts. Make sense? And it will go all the way up to, remember in uh, Linux we had to tell it how long it was? In DOS, strings must be terminated by a dollar sign. Therefore, we don't have to know. We can just walk till we hit a dollar sign. Make sense? All right, so we'll move into AH that. Uh, that's right string to screen. Then we'll move into DX, the offset from DS, which is the pointer to the beginning of our data segment of our message. Um, and then we'll interrupt. So it's what, int 21H? That's what it is, right? 
Yep. All right, so we'll interrupt, and then there's an output associated with this guy. So this returns in AL a 24H of everything worked okay, because um, you're not reading anything in. It's more of like a success flag. All right, so let's go ahead and um, we'll run this, because this should print out hello world to our screen. We'll go ahead and run. There's hello world. Now it's waiting for me to do my key press thing that's in our loop until we press enter. So I can start typing that stuff and press enter. Now our program's done. That makes sense? All right, so that's how we write a string to the screen. Okay, now what we want to do there is a way to read in a string that we'll look at uh, after we uh, do this uh, ghetto version first. All right. But what we want to do is we want to read a string in and then write the string out. But we only know how to read things one character at a time right now. All right. So we have to read in one character at a time, one character at a time, one character at a time until we hit, until we press enter. That means we're done. Right. We're done with the string. We already got that part working. But what do we need to do when we're done with the string? How do we cap off our string and say, here's a string? Dollar sign. All right, so we end it with a dollar sign. But now we gotta say, well, what's it? So right now we're just echoing to the screen. We're not actually storing those characters anywhere. So how many characters do we enter in before we press enter? Who knows, right? Now, we are going to have to give ourselves a limit here. We're dealing with a pretty old architecture, so we, uh, um, we don't necessarily have unlimited storage, although we probably could invent something to not be unlimited, but make the limitation when we just run out of RAM. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a landing area for our string components, for our values of our string. All right, so if I want to store a collection of characters in a normal programming language, where do we put that? What represents a collection of characters? Character array, right? We store arrays of things. Okay, so if we look at arrays, uh, we're going to do a little exercise here first. Huh? See, I'm always testing you. you failed that one. Yeah, I'm old. You're young. That stuff may mean something to you. Until he gets 40. Yeah. I mean, you should see me playing those first-person shooters. You would understand. No, no, no. <laughs> RTS. I'm worse at first-person shooters. Really? Yeah, you're RTS, worse. RTS, worse RTS at... is more of a patience problem. First-person shooters is a... Call of Duty, then you're, you're, you're worse at Call of Duty than you are at StarCraft. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, like StarCraft, I think I could actually be pretty good at StarCraft. Not professional good, because I think that's when reflexes really come in. Reflexes. But I think I could be pretty good at StarCraft from a competent perspective. Yeah. I don't think I could be, I don't think any level of practice would make me good at a first-person shooter. Too much shakes? No, I mean, I just, just too much going on for me. I mean, it's a, I think that's, as you get older, that's what you first start noticing is your ability to process a whole bunch of inputs at once starts wavering. I never thought it when I was your age either, <laughs> but it happens. You start getting, you feel old, right around 35 or so. That's true. I mean, why did you do the Legends play when you retire at 25? Because they weren't quite enough out of it. All right. Um, so we need to look at arrays in um, uh, assembly. So I think I still, do I still have the, the guy up here? Yeah. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to steal a couple of his things here. Well, actually, let's just walk through this real quick. Um, save us a little bit of time. So we defined a couple of arrays here. We have num1, which is going to be a data byte. So that's going to be a pointer to something, right? So when we learned about arrays and whatever class you, you had with me when we talked about arrays, arrays get represented in contiguous memory, right? And we get a pointer to the base address, and then everything else is an offset from that. It should start becoming a kind of a theme. We're kind of seeing where all that came from. Because we're seeing it over and over and over again here. So we're creating a variable called num1, whose value is a data byte, a pointer to the base address of that guy. 
And this is giving us our initial value. So just comma delimited numbers. So this is going to be a five bucket array with uh, two, six, one, three, five loaded into it. Num two is going to have these five elements in it. And then we're creating another five bucket array. So here's a variable called sum. It's going to be a data byte with five things duplicated by zero. All right, so this is kind of the, the interesting thing here. So let me right here, I'll do this in I my... I have a quick question. Yep. So you know how we talk about using message in uh, using a data byte and then how you can self up store hello world in it? Mm-hmm. Well, why can't you move hello world in the message? Why can't you move hello world? The literal? So, so you want to do this. Does it store it like a string array or like a char array? So if you try to move that, yeah. So okay, you so you want to that. start off like this and then you want to move into message. Uh, I'm on the PC side. That. That's the literal you want to move in there. All right, so cannot convert 16-bit values to hello world. So this guy is a string literal, right? Yeah. That's what this dude is. He's a string literal. This dude is expecting a... Um, uh, this guy is expecting a 16-bit value, all right? Uh, actually, it's expecting an 8-bit value because we're it's a data byte. That was kind of a weird message then. Well, the other, but the thing is, though, data bytes like 16-bit, right? No, 16-bits is two bytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a word. But the thing is, with data byte, that you showed us the different, um, the four or five different, um, different types of variables. Mm -hmm. Only two of them work. You mean what's allowed to be used in move? Yeah. So, no, no. So, like, either, what was it? Was it double? Or so, we have DB. Yeah. We have DW, yeah. which is a data word. Yeah. And then we have... There was double something, or there was, like, DD or something. Yeah, DD, I think, is a that double word. That didn't work. Uh, it's, or it, this is 16-bit architecture, so the largest you probably can store is 16 bits. Yeah. Which would be a word. Put an offset in front of the string and see what happens then. Uh, well, no, because off offset takes it gives us the offset from a base segment. Yeah. Uh, see, this guy right here is a string literal, so we're bringing it into existence right here. Now, what we could do, just to you know play devil's advocate here, we can say um, val is a db that's equal to oh, I zigged when I should have zagged that guy. And then we should be able to move into message then um, the value of db, because db, I'm sorry, not value of db, the value of val, because val should hold the base address of this string literal. So this line right here creates the string literal, puts it in memory somewhere, and then val ultimately holds the address of that. Um, this should work. We might actually have to say address in front, but I think it'll work just as is. Because um, I think val resolves to its value, which is the address, not to a string literal. Uh, so it really comes down to how DOS actually handles strings. Uh, wrong parameters, move can't, message. Can't, uh, do, uh... The memory into memory, that's right. So this would have to be something like move into... Uh, dx val, then move into message dx, um, something like that, since it seems to be treating those as 16 bits. So, uh, operands do not match. Yeah, it's an 8-bit address. So, dl, dl. Now, the, the error message is very strange that it's saying 16 bits when it is an 8-bit thing. Um, I guess whatever. All right, what so, oh, double. yeah, D, DX is 16 bits. The whole reason I put it in DX is because we were getting the error message before saying well, double, that double bytes only. this is not a double byte. DB is data byte. Oh, data byte. Yeah, data byte, which is, you're right, eight. It's eight bits. 
But the error message we were getting was that you can't put something that's well, uh, eight to sixteen. Is what it was. Right, but message should not be sixteen. Message is a data byte. Should be eight. Yeah, that's right. But it was complaining that you can't put an eight into a sixteen. The error message said sixteen. This this is not sixteen. No, but that was that's eight with the DX when you got the error. I, the, the whole reason I did the DX is because two error messages ago, it said you can't that the tar, the destination was a sixteen bit address when it should have been eight. So I was assuming it was treating it as a sixteen bit for some reason. That's why I threw it in the sixteen bit register. So we'll put an eight bit register. Are we we're walking through now. Okay, so we'll move into. Mess uh, actually, we're still up top there. I just have stuff highlighted. So we'll move into DL val. All right, so there is uh, DL, so that's 68, which I assume is the hexadecimal value for H. Is that right? ASCII table. H, H is in the... Oh, oh, ASCII. Uh, Uppercase or lowercase h? Uh, it's neither. No. That should be a D. 104 is lowercase. Yeah. Uppercase is 72. All right, so that means that this is that what I put into DL 68 must be the address of that value. Which is okay. 60, 68, that, that's reasonable. That's so H. that's H. In decimal, it's one hundred four, which is lowercase. Oh, oh, so sixty-eight hex is H. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're good. That that is H. All right. So that means that what is currently inside of DL is val at bucket zero. That's that's the uh, the that whole base address thing we've talked about, like in Java. So then I'll move into message, D L. All right, so uh, I think I have variables here somewhere. Yeah, vars. So here's message. It has 68 H in it. So I can see those values there. Um, then I'll move into D X, the offset of message. Um, and the offset of message is going to be where message lives in relative to my data segment. So I'm going to do offset of message. And then I'll interrupt, which should put it out to the screen. And there's our hello world. So you can do it. Um, you just can't do it directly because a string literal has to be created somewhere. Okay. Um, so you know that has to be done inside the data segment. Okay. Um, so what was I doing? Oh, we were creating some uh, array stuff, right? So let's go ahead and we're going to call this, um, uh, we'll say AR is a data byte 5 dupe 0. So this means make a 0 show up 5 times. Fill AR with that value. So that'll be, this is a 5 bucket array initialized to zeros. That's what that guy will ultimately produce. Okay. Um, so now, uh, let's do, well, let's look at working with the arrays. I'll kick this down. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, well, here, look at our example here. I think it was here, right? All right. So when we work with this guy, we need to work with the offset of those arrays. So he has three arrays created here. Num1 and num2 are pre-filled with actual values. So here's a syntax for throwing immediate values into that array. And it organizes them in contiguous memory for us. Um, then sum, here's kind of like what we just did. We created a five element array in our little example right now that is initialized to a bunch of zeros. You don't need to initialize it if you don't want to. Just zeros gives you a baseline. The reason they initialized it to zero is they're doing a summing exercise here where they're taking this guy plus this guy and putting it at bucket zero of the other array. So you kind of need a, a zero base to add to. So that's why they initialized it to zero, but it gave me the opportunity to show you the, the dupe thing. 
All right, so then they're moving into, uh, some, these are just some registers. They're moving into BX, the offset of num1, which is the relative position of num1 from the base DS register, data segment. We're moving into SI, the offset of num2. It didn't have to be SI, but that's, that's fine. Um, so that we now know in uh, BX and SI where these guys live relative to the base address of the data segment. We'll move into DI, the offset of sum. So also now, so we, we have pointer availability now to that segment of memory. All right. So all of this stuff, our, our, uh, our model lives inside of this data segment. All that data lives there. So we need to get to the beginning of our data segment offset to where this guy lives so that we can start writing crap in here. All right. So num2 should live at five times, um, these are data bytes, so five times eight, which is 40. Okay, so that guy should live 40 bytes after the, uh, um, num2 should live 40 bytes after the end of num1, or the beginning of num1, rather. These are all contiguous in the data segment. So the data segment's a giant array. So num1 lives in the first five buckets here. Num2 is the next five buckets. Uh, sum is the next five buckets, all right next to each other, but based off an offset from DS, which is the beginning address of our data segment. So beginning address of uh, num1 will be right here. Beginning address of num2 will be this offset. Beginning address of sum will be this offset. So that takes us, we have pointers to those three variables, the actual memory positions of those three variables stored in these three registers, BX, SI, and DI. All right, then they're moving into CX or counter five because we're gonna do something five times. We're doing looping crap. Um, so what do they do here? They move into AX, the current, so this says give me the value at memory address BX. So this guy right here should be the bucket, in this case, bucket zero, of um, BX is num1. So this will be a two. That makes sense? So that guy will be a two. So just to show that, um, let's go ahead and actually fill this guy up with uh, uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. Good enough. So there's our array, has those guys in it, and then let's go ahead and let's move into DX. Um, this is going to be, well, actually this would be a good example. So I'm going to move into DX AR. Okay, so let's see what we get out of DX here. Oh. Sorry, wrong size operands. DL. Doesn't matter, I'm doing it twice. We just want to see the result of this guy. So we'll step. So we'll look at uh, DL. And there's our two, which is bucket zero of that array. Make sense? So now the question is, how do I get to bucket one of that array? How do I get to the four? Okay, so you want me to, oh, I need to do this again. Or just, it should be increment AR. Or, well, well, AR is an array. Yeah, so it would be the, you increment the register that it's in. Okay, so you want me to say inc DL? Mm -hmm. What's that going to do? That will increment the address of the array. So it will increment the address to the next bucket of the array. What does DL hold right now? After this, oh, what value is in DL after holds, that? It holds the value, not. It holds the, the number two. So you'd have to. If I increment two, what do I get? I get a three. Even Tim got it right. <laughs> At some point he's gonna throw something. <laughs> so you think you're better than me? <laughs> All right. 
So yeah, that's not going to work. But we're on to the right path here. So I, I didn't want to show you that. Well, like I said I didn't want to show you. It's just like up on the screen there. All right. <laughs> so we need to be able to walk through memory, right? So you want to increment through memory. You don't want to increment the two. You want to increment the position of the two. So in order to do that, we're going to need to store in a register the address that we're interested in. Okay. Right now, when we say move into, so let me get rid of this right here. When we say move AR into DL, what we're saying is, is put the memory address, we'll put the value of AR, which is a memory address. It just happens to be memory address, which is the base address of AR, plus zero times size of, in this case, a byte, they're data bytes. So bucket zero and the base address are one and the same. That's why we're getting the value that we think we should be getting. The problem is, is how do we get to the next value? How do we get to that four? So what we're going to need to do is we need to store the base address of AR. Not AR itself, but the base address so that we can increment the address. Make sense? So we're going to go ahead and let's move into... Um, we can move into... SI, which is our source index register. And we'll move into that guy, the offset of AR. So now we have the base address of SI. Oh, that we have in SI is the base address offset from the DS pointer. So at the beginning of our data segment. So now if I move into DL, the value of SI. So that says, not the address, don't give me the address that SI is, give me the value at SI. What's the difference between the offset and the at symbol? Or the at symbol? Because we're trying to use that previously. The at, okay, yeah, the at symbol gives you the address of something. Um, I don't think it would work. Well, when you use the at symbol, it says, give me the address of this guy. But that I think that will give you the global address from the base of this entire program as opposed to the offset of that guy from our data segment. The reality here in the small model, it might give you the same value. We can test it here in a second. So let me run this. So... Step. So we'll move into SI, the base address of AR. So here's uh, um, SI right down here. So this is 110. All right. So, uh, and I think we noticed that we had our uh, uh, data segment started at 100. So uh, where's DS? Oh, 700. So 700, an offset of 110 from, uh, what was that, SI? So 110 hex is equal to what in decimal? Let's see if the math. So this is the uh, 116s, 256. So 256 plus 16 is 270. 272? Okay. So. Uh, Do they have a nice little converter like built into this? I have a head. <laughs> what do you convert her for? Which the ASCII character is a smiley face. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right. So inside of SI, we have the offset of AR. All right. Um, so that should be the base. That should be the at, the the offset from the base address of our data segment where AR lives. So now I'm going to move into DL. This guy should read the value at SI. So we expect DL to become bucket zero of this guy, which is a two. There's our two. Make sense? So right now in DL after this line, DL holds a two, which is the value at the current address at SI points. So now, going back to what you wanted to do, we're gonna increment SI. That adds one to the byte pointer that is SI. 
which should then get us to our next value. So, so we're going to say inc si. So add one to that base address, one times the size of the, uh, the thing, which is a byte. Then we'll move into dl, the value of si, like this. Okay. Run this. So we'll go ahead and move into DL the two. So there's our uh, two in DL. Then we're going to increment SI. So SI is currently 110. Okay, now it's 111. So one byte bigger, even though it's in hex, but it's the one byte bigger. Then we'll move into DL overwriting the two with whatever value lives at the address pointed to by SI which is our four, the second bucket of the array. Make sense how that works? So instead of using BB for AR, if you use like uh, BW or X or whatever it's R, you would have to add increment more than just one? Correct. Yep, you gotta take big enough jumps yeah, through right. memory to, oh. to represent right, it. That's, yeah, I forgot they were bytes, so that's yep. cool. Uh, all right, questions about any of that? All right. So let's take a um, no more than 10 minute break because we have another exercise we want to do when we come back. But what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take all the stuff that we've done here, what we understand about strings and how strings are terminated and all that stuff. We want to read in from the user one character at a time over and over and over again, storing that somewhere, probably in an array, probably store the ASCII value, okay, which is a byte size value over and over and over and over again until they hit enter that should terminate our string so then finish the string and then print the whole string out so instead of echoing it we're printing the whole string out that makes sense read characters in one uh, character at a time until we press enter then display the entire string so you needed to be storing that string inside of a uh, uh, array the entire time and for the the this exercise you could assume that the maximum string length is 16 or something like that you know, just pick a pick a length any length um, but remember that the one of the buckets is for the s so if you pick 16 that means you can only store 15 characters you're gonna need that terminating <laughs> s goes somewhere or i'm sorry the dollar sign dollar sign yeah the old vegetable lasagna up here <laughs> all right so take a quick 10 minute break and then come back and use the same teams